track your entire business process. So that may be putting in, um, if you deal with orders and shipping and invoicing, you can handle that in your CRM. You can handle your personnel, so HR, if you wanna deal with timesheets or time off, um, vacation requests, company reviews, et cetera. That can all be within your CRM as well. And lastly, all of your online marketing efforts can be in your CRM. So I work exclusively with salesforce.com clients. Um, I don't get paid by them. I'm not here to have some type of advertisement or infomercial. But the reason that I work with them is because they are the leading CRM. Um, if you think about the Apple Store or the Android Store, Salesforce has what they call the App Exchange. And they have hundreds of thousands of apps that you can basically hook up into your Salesforce and bring in all of your other technologies into one system. So Salesforce really strives to be your number one platform for all of your business processes. Um, so what I wanna focus on on this part is the marketing aspect of that. So um, a lot of times people do different types of online marketing efforts. Um, a big one that a lot of people do is email marketing. So you may be thinking, um, Jen, I have my Excel file or my, my database over here. I have my constant contact over here. What's the point of blending the two? Why do we need both of these systems completely in sync? And that's a great question. So if you think about um, your marketing automation, uh, does anyone here use a marketing automation platform? Excellent, which one do you use? Uh, oh, good, great. So um, at the end of this presentation, I'm gonna go through all of the players or some of the big players in the market so you all know if, if you wanna move in this direction, you know, what are the companies and, and what are the baseline costs? But, if you think of marketing automation, it's, it's basically email marketing on steroids. So with email marketing, you have your content, you have your assets, you have your lists, and basically what you're doing is taking that and sending it out. With marketing automation, you get much more of an online package. So you can create landing pages without the use of a developer. That means if you're sending an email and you want to create a specific call to action and a specific offer, you can, you can do that yourself. There's no coding, there's no um, need to bring in other team members. You can handle that all, all on your own. There's also lead scoring. So you can basically create a scale and determine how sales ready someone may be. And so, so that when they meet, reach that threshold, you can push them over to the sales team. There's also um, buying, that should say personas, but personals will work too. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, um, so you can create buying personas. So that means who are these people and what are they interested in? And once you know that, you can use all of this intelligence to talk to them much more directly. There's also dynamic content. So how to take one asset and use it amongst all these different personas to save yourself time when it comes to actually creating stuff in the back end. There's also website tracking, so the visibility of who is looking at what, how are people engaging with your website. There's also social media. Um, if someone is engaging with, uh, you know, say they share something on Facebook, say they retweet something of yours, you can pull that into your database and have access to that engagement. Um, as well as analytics and, and um, ROI, so all, all of your reporting. Now, something to keep in mind is you have your CRM and you have your marketing automation. These are both completely in sync with one another. So no longer is sales and marketing working in silos, but all of this information passes completely through both platforms, really creating that, that visibility for your entire organization. You may be wondering why it's important and, and why you should invest in this newfangled technology. Well, the reason is because I'm, I'm sure as your search patterns have changed of how you deal with products, uh, across the board, consumers are, are doing a lot more of their research up front. So that means they are two thirds of the way through the sales cycle before they're even willing to talk to you. So what does that mean for you as a business owner? Well, something that I always do, I use the analogy of um, project management software because I think at some point we've all worked for a company where it's going off the rails and 
deadlines are missed and you can't keep track of everything, the first thing you're gonna do is go to Google and you're gonna search, how do I manage my team? How do I create tasks? How do I manage a budget? Google's gonna give you an array of results and based on that, you're, you'll probably hand select a few uh, based on what interests you, but then you're gonna go to your network more than likely. Maybe you go to LinkedIn, you're, you're part of a group of professionals that you trust and you say, I'm looking at these three products, what do you all recommend? Or you put something out on Facebook or Twitter. Well, the brand advocates that use that product or um, that use something similar, they're usually the ones that are gonna give you that feedback and help influence that decision for you. So then the last step is you're gonna go to the company website and at that point, you're gonna more than likely be asking for something like pricing, for product comparison, maybe you wanna have a demo of the actual product. You don't have to be sold at this point. You've done majority of the research on your own. At this point, it's now a formality of, okay, I know I want this, how much is it gonna cost? And you're really through um, all that, you don't really have to go through that initial negotiation or research with a sales rep because you've done it on your own. You've done it through through your social network. So having all this technology in place has really changed the sales cycle. So I think we're all familiar with the sales funnel and really how things flow through from you know, initially getting, getting that first contact or, or lead and, and how do they flow through and actually convert to uh, become a sale. Well, back in the day, the top of the funnel is really what belonged to marketing. So marketing would say, okay, well, my responsibility is to generate leads. So that's, what, that's the only thing I'm gonna focus on. I'm gonna put ads in the paper, I'm gonna send out print collateral, I'm gonna do some online advertising. The only thing I care about is getting, getting those leads into the system. And as soon as they would come in, they would be handed off to the sales team. So, and marketing would be removed from the rest of that process. And really what that would mean is marketing didn't know much in terms of what are my dollars resulting in. It was more of, here's the money I've invested, okay sales, you, you take it over from here, my, my job is done. Well, that resulted in a leaky funnel. And, and really what that meant is just revenue is flowing out and, and you're, you're missing out on a lot of revenue because leads were not being followed up on. Um, I have sat at the table with sales and marketing um, on both sides, not really liking each other that much, and I've heard every excuse in the book as to why a sales rep will not follow up on a marketing lead. As marketers, I'm sure most of you all have been in these conversations where a sales rep says something like, everything marketing generates is junk, so I'm, I'm just not even going to call on that person. And, and marketing is saying, well, I know we, we generated 300 leads this month and you all haven't touched them. And, and the battle goes back and forth where sales has this bias of, well, these leads aren't good enough for me or I'm, I'm too busy with my, my own leads or cold calling or following up on trade show leads that I'm not even going to touch these leads. Well, with marketing automation in place with your CRM, the sales funnel is essentially going to flip. So now, marketing has a much higher place in the game in terms of what their responsibilities are. Instead of just generating that top of the funnel, they're now responsible for qualifying leads. They're responsible for nurturing leads. So if a lead is not ready for a sales team, it's up to marketing now to get the right content to them, to push them along, to qualify them, to get them to sales. So ideally, by the time a lead gets to a sales rep, it has been pre-qualified. And, and a sales rep now has the intelligence of, okay, I have visibility to know what this person has done. I, I can see that they um, have in fact reached the right score. They've, they've taken part in all of these different online activities. I can use that intelligence and now sell to them. So, um, let me just explain how this works and, and really how the systems integrate with each other. So what, what you do is you take a JavaScript snippet of code that may sound really techy, it's, it's not that hard to do, but you take code and you put it on your website, just like you would Google Analytics or any other tracking code. And basically, from the moment 
a, someone comes to your website, you start tracking them. A cookie is dropped on, on their browser and on their computer, and that's not like the chocolate chip type of cookie, it's actually a tracking cookie, which means every single thing that that person, does, that person does, whether it's clicking on, on a link, watching a video, um, downloading something, you're, you're tracking all of that. The goal is to get incentivize that person to fill out a form. So maybe they sign up for a webinar. Maybe they sign up for your uh, email newsletter. Well, as soon as you can get their name, you then have all this activity and you, you start to build this profile. You start to see who is this person, what are they interested in, what, how have they been engaging with our website and with our content, and you start to build out that intelligence of who they are. So with that, you can start to score people. So the great thing is you can score all of their behaviors. So what pages did they click on? Did they open my email? How much of this video did they watch? Did they download a specific white paper? You can take a, a, a number and assign that to all of them. Same thing with demographic information. So uh, ideally, in the beginning, you may start with a short form and you might not have all this information, but over time, you're gonna start to collect it. Or if, if you all remember, because it's synced with your CRM, you're gonna be able to take that data from your CRM and also store that as well. So if you're able to, to know either from a web form or within the CRM, what's their company size, what's their annual revenue, where are they located, you can score that. And something to keep in mind is that the scoring always runs in the background. So once you set it up, it's always running. Um, so meaning if someone comes into the system and you score them initially and six months later you get more information or they come back to your website, it's gonna continue to score them. And this is not taking any of marketing's time, it's just automatically happening. Also, if you use a product or a service and you integrate that data with your CRM, then um, you can score that as well. So some of my clients um, sell software, and so they wanna track um, how many licenses did this person buy? When was the last time they actually logged into it? Can I upsell them based on their usage? And so you can pull that into your marketing automation platform and score that. The goal is to create the threshold of when is someone sales ready. So everyone kind of works on a different scale. This is just an example and we'll dive into this a little at the end. But ideally you start on a zero through 100 or zero through 200 um, scale. If you're using Pardot, it's a little different, but you, you want to get to the place where you say, okay, based on all of these activities that we know we are tracking and scoring, this is the magic number where we can say this person is sales ready. And so with that, you establish ownership. You may establish different lead statuses um, or, or lead stages, which again are going to correlate with that funnel that we looked at at the beginning. And when someone hits that magic number, the marketing automation platform is gonna automatically assign them to the appropriate sales rep. Again, this is not taking marketing's time. This doesn't mean that as, as a person on the marketing team or as the marketing team yourself, you are manually and individually qualifying all of these people. When you set the logic up in the system, it's gonna automatically do it on the, on the back end when, when the specific criteria is met. Now, let's say that someone is not sales ready, but they are, um, you know, if we're on that one through 100 scale and 30 is what pushed it to an inside sales team, let's say someone's sitting at, a, at 20 for a while. What, what you want to do is you want to cre create content to send to the right person based on where they are in that sales cycle. So uh, right here, we're looking at the personas and the buying stage and different pieces of content for all of that. I'm not gonna stick, I'm not gonna talk much about the content piece because Heather's gonna cover that. But basically, the idea is that you are sending content to people based on who they are and what they're interested in. And if you're feeling overwhelmed, like you have to create 12 different pieces of content, um, the beautiful thing is marketing automation is going to allow you to create dynamic content. So while you're still going to actually need to write out different pieces based on personas and where they are in the cycle, in terms of actually 
getting that information into the technology, you don't necessarily have to create individual pieces. You can use dynamic content to inject different information into different emails, into different landing pages. Um, because you're gonna send different, different info to different people. If someone is a admin assistant and you have them in your system versus a CTO, you're gonna to wanna to talk to them differently because one of those people is just researching and the other is probably a decision maker. So you really wanna hit people on a one-to-one -one basis. You wanna start building that relationship because as they engage with your content and your website and you're collecting their information, you're building out this complete profile of who are they, what do they want, and how can I intelligently sell to them? And again, once you put this all together, combined with lead scoring, it, it's going to accelerate your sales cycle. You're gonna see that because you have this information, because it's visible across the entire board, it's, it's gonna speed things up for you. Now, a great thing is that you can use conditional logic here. So, I don't know about anyone else, I grew up in a household where my dad did not have tools, he had WD-40 and duct tape. <laughs> so that was how he determined, like, how am I gonna fix something? Sometimes it was incredibly disastrous, but you can take that same conditional logic and apply it to your marketing initiatives. So that, that is really saying you're using if-then statements. And that's how you're, deci you're deciding what you wanna send to different people, how you wanna score them, how you wanna engage with them. So an example may be, let's say you offer a product trial um, that's a 30-day free trial. Well, anyone that's in that trial, you wanna send them an email every four days because you, you know you have 30 days to sell them and you want them to completely understand the technology so that they convert to a paying customer. Well, what happens if that person converts before them? You, you probably don't wanna be sending them that, that information anymore. Or what if they tell you, you know, I'm not interested in this product, I actually wanna get something else. Well, then you don't wanna send them that information either. So again, by using this if-then logic, if they're in a 30-day trial, if they're a non-paying customer, if they've told me that um, they are still interested in this product, then I'm gonna send them an email every four days. But when any of that criteria is no longer met, it's gonna automatically remove them. So again, you're talking to people individually, you're creating that relationship, you're listening to what they're telling you by either sending them more content or sending them less, and, and really building that, that relationship with them. And again, this results in CRM transparency. So this is a screenshot of Salesforce, but what you can see here is um, these are all of the activities that someone has taken part of. So by the time a sales rep picks up the phone and actually talks to someone, they can literally see every website they've hit, every email they've opened, every video they watch. So again, they are using intelligence to talk to this person and to sell, and to, sell to them. And also, you can see there's also a, a lead score, there's a rating, sometimes there can be a grade, so that sales reps aren't just cold calling all the time, or they're not just, you know, picking up leads out of, out of a random list within the CRM, but they can literally say, you know, show me all of my leads that are between 50 and, and 90 points, and they can start from the top and prioritize them that way. Again, it's gonna continue to update um, automatically, so every single day, uh, they're probably gonna have a, a different list of people that they need to call on or prioritize. And lastly, <coughs> this really gives marketing a place at the revenue table. So I, I mentioned that you know previously marketing was just spending money and generating leads and not necessarily having the means to report on that. Well now marketing can say that you know I spent $1,000 on LinkedIn ads and I know it resulted in $5,000 in revenue and here are the exact deals that came through from that ad. So the, the important thing to know is that market, marketers are now responsible for that. I think, I think many years ago when the technology wasn't there, it was okay to get away with saying, well, I, I'm not sure I can't track that. Or we don't have visibility to, you know, once someone clicks on this ad, what happens to them? Now the technology is there and, and there, there's a way to, to literally report on every single dollar. There's a way to report on every single different campaign. So that as you start segmenting your messaging to, to different groups, 
um, to different social networks, you're able to see exactly what was the outcome of every single dollar that you've spent, and that's gonna help you in a few different ways. It's gonna help you know where do you wanna spend more um, money in the future, where do you wanna prioritize your content efforts, and, and best of all, it's gonna give marketing more credibility because now you're able to, to sit at the table with everyone else and really show them exactly what you've done for the company. And this results in marketing and sales alignment. <laughs> so because of this, everyone is now on the same page. Everyone has the same objectives, the same visibility, and the same metrics that they're working, working on. So everyone has the exact same goals which means long gone are the conversations of, of sales on one side and marketing on the other side of the table where they're literally butting heads. Um, I, I have a client that I came in and sat down with them and, and in the beginning, I mean, it was very hostile. And at the end of it, they were literally, I mean, best friends because they were able to see that by working together, by figuring out stuff like what do we want to score or what's important content, um, they really started to get along because they, they needed each other and they really helped each other. This is usually the part where people get really excited and they want to run out the room, don't leave yet, but, and, and start to implement this. So just a few disclaimers um, of what marketing automation is not. So it's not a magic switch. You can't go you know, spend the money on the platform and, and just automatically expect it's going to work for you or leads are going to come in or sales and marketing are gonna automatically love each other. You, you do actually have to put the work in up front and, and get everyone aligned on, okay, what are we doing here? You know, what, what are the metrics we wanna track? What, what are the um, items that we wanna score? And what's, what's most important? How do we prioritize this? It's not an easy button. So there are gonna be some tough conversations. There's gonna have to be some compromise between both teams. Um, to really figure out, you know, how do you deploy this while meeting everyone's needs? And lastly, it's not a batch and blaster. So the first thing that I do when I come into a company is, is I conduct an audit to see how are they using the systems. And a lot of times people are spending all of this money for marketing automation software and they're using it as a glorified email platform. So that means they're sending everyone the same message, it's not tailored, um, it's not based on who they are, whether they're an actual prospect or a customer. Everyone's getting the same message. And so what does that mean? Well, it means you're spamming them, but it also means you're not creating that relationship. You're not talking to them. You're, you're basically just talking at them. So um, the first thing that I do with clients is I say, okay, well, let's just stop all this email madness for a minute and put all these different systems in place um, such as scoring um, and start to do things piece by piece. So this is just a look at who some of the big players are and so that if you all are thinking that you wanna move in this direction, um, this is a baseline of the pricing that, that we're talking about here. Now, I, I also wanna give the disclaimer that these are the baseline prices so please don't quote me on this, like don't call any of these companies and say, Jen Stretch said it would only cost this amount because people are probably gonna upsell you. Um, I mentioned Salesforce, it's the number one CRM platform. Um, it starts at $25 a user a month. That price is not gonna work with marketing automation. So if you're looking for marketing automation, you're gonna automatically have to spend $65 a user a month. Um, they do offer a free trial, so if this interests you, I recommend going and signing up for a free trial. They're not even going to take a credit card, um, but that's going to let you just kind of click around and see, okay, do I actually want to invest in this? Zoho is a pretty big one. They have actually a free edition, um, and then their plans start at $12 a user a month and go up. Um, so the importance of, of these prices, when it says user a month, that means the good news is, as your company continues to scale, you can add more users, um, and, and as people leave, you can cut off those accounts. So the pricing really becomes flexible based on how your company grows. Um, MS Dynamics, that's by Microsoft, um, Oracle, uh, a little more expensive, about $100 a month, and ACT is about $10 a month. Um, I believe ACT is not web-based, though. 
So some of the marketing automation platforms, there are three big ones on the market right now. The first one is Marketo. That's gonna start at about $900 a month in addition to your CRM prices. Pardot is another one, it's about 1,000 a month. That is now owned by Salesforce. So you, if you look at any Salesforce collateral, you're gonna see their name with them quite a bit. And then lastly, Eloqua um, is about 2,000 a month and that's now owned by Oracle. And there's two platforms that are kind of CRM and marketing automation combined. Um, one is Infusionsoft, which is about 300 a month, and the other is HubSpot. Uh, which is 800 a month. So I don't work with either of those platforms, but I know um, a bit about them both. Um, my feedback would be, from my experience, I've seen as businesses grow, um, they tend to outgrow those. So they're really good for small businesses, but sometimes if you have more technical needs or you have a really large database, um, I've seen companies just out, outgrow those, but they are great for what they are at a good price too. So my recommendation to you all is that you do not have to boil the ocean. Um, people get really excited um, when they start to bring on new technology and, and they either go at it so fast that they do everything completely wrong or they get so overwhelmed and they lose all of their momentum. So I just want to encourage you, if this is the direction you're thinking about taking your company in, it's okay to do things piece by piece. So as I mentioned, lead scoring always happens in the background. Well, a great thing is that you can continue to add lead scoring and refine it, and it's gonna, it will retroactively score people. So remember, they're in your system, they, they've been cookied, you're tracking them. So you're not missing out on anything by, by taking things in small pieces and building out this platform over time. Um, my recommendation would be that you all um, Get, get the team on board and establish accountability within, within the company. So someone's gotta own it. You've gotta make sure that you have the expertise or you have a consultant that can help you with it. Um, you also wanna look at your data. So marketing automation platforms are great for um, keeping duplicates out of the system. They do that based on, on having a, a unique email address but if you're using a CRM that has a bunch of junk data and then you implement a marketing automation platform with it, well, you're just creating a huge headache. So I always recommend to look at your data first before you tie, tie the two together. Um, and then lastly, look at the different pieces of your process that are currently uh, a manual uh, initiative for someone and start to build those out slowly over time in the marketing automation platform. So an example would be um, if someone is manually following up, following up on all of your web leads anytime someone comes into the system, or if you are manually alerting sales reps that, you know, this person looks qualified, give them a call. These are things that you can put in the system now and, and really get familiar with it. And then over time, start to do some of the big picture items like the nurturing campaigns, like the content for every person. And again, build it over time. So that concludes the part where I talk nonstop, <laughs> um, which is good. But what <coughs> I wanted to do, everyone should have a worksheet, hopefully. Does anyone not have them? Does anyone not want one? <laughs> okay, so what I wanted to do... Good. Anyone else need one? Hello. <laughs> um, so basically, what I wanted to do is send you all away with something that is going to keep you thinking about, you know, what are the things that I need to have in place to... Um, to get this up and running. Again, you can build this out over time, but these are really some of the main principles or the main tactics of marketing automation. Um, so the first thing is that lead scoring scale. Um, this is typically a conversation between sales and marketing, and sometimes it's as basic as, do we go on a zero through 100 scale, zero through 200, you know, what are these numbers and what's the magic number? Um, and then with that, you can establish ownership. So throughout that, um, those numbers, who's gonna own it at different points? Um, I'm gonna just kind of go through these one by one, but does anyone have any questions specific to lead scoring that I can answer? 
Oh, come on. <laughs> okay. Well, what are some of the main things that you use for lead scoring? What data points? Like, what are the most common things that you start with? Um, so a really, that's a great question. Thank the you. The question was, <laughs> what are some of the main things that you score? So um, typically, you want to start with your website. And so you want to look at, um, actually, I'll jump to the next slide. This is number two on, on your list. And these are just some examples. But um, you want to look at your website and you want to see, okay, what are the really important pages on this website? As an example, if you have a demo, um, if you have a page with a video where people can learn more about your product or your service, then that's a page you want to score. You'll probably want to integrate some type of video tracking to score, you know, did they click play, how long did they watch it. Um, any page that has a web form, you're going to want to score, and you may even want to score that form in addition to it. So, you know, did they visit the page and then did they fill out the form and, and give it a combined score. Um, and something to keep in mind, you can also have negative scores. So let's say um, you have a page that is uh, just a careers page. So that probably means someone wants to work for you, which means they're not a, a prospect. Um, so maybe you give them a negative score. You can also give negative scores based on activity. So we talked about that you're tracking you know, every single one of their, their moves as they go through your website and interact with with your content, well, if they if they are not engaged, you're able to see okay when was the last person when was the last time this person actually visited the website, and then you can score based on that. So if someone's inactive for a long period of time, um, then you can decrease their score. Um, so I would recommend you start with your website and really the key pieces there, and as you add more key pieces, you can add that to your scoring. And then in terms of demographic information, you need to think about what's important for your sales team. So what is a, what would a qualified company be? You know, what are those data points? Does it have to be a company that's 50 or more? Is it based specifically on revenue? Is it based on a technology? And then score based on that. So um, you'll see in number two, um, it's basically just a little chart. And the idea is that, that you would sit down with sales and marketing and you all would fill that out together and then you would come to um, an agreement on you know, what the values of everything should be. And, and I always recommend every three months you look at it because it could be that you put all the scoring in and it's really inflated. And so marketing says, or sales says, this is great, you, know, you assigned me 20 leads in the past week, but they're not sales ready yet. And so that would mean that your scoring is, you're scoring a little too high or your threshold is too low. And so you need to find the balance between the two. Any other questions on scoring? Well, there's just one thing I wanted to mention that we do with scoring that's a little bit different is there's actually two scores. There's a letter and a number. And the letter is for um, these title and the number is for engagement. So it's a way to kind of pair the two things you're talking about there into one score. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a great point um, because Parnot also does that as well, where they will have a numerical score for the activity and then a grade, a, a, um, a B, C, or D based on the demographic information. So, and you said you use Eloqua, right? Yeah, so every system does it a, a little differently, um, but you know the end result is the same. You're really trying to determine how sales ready someone may be. Um, the, the next number three on here is going through the different lead stages. Now, I have six here. That may be overkill for your company, or it, it may be just right. But the idea is um, when, you, when you start with a, a new lead and it comes into the system, what are the different stages that person is going to go through, and what is um, who's going to own it and, and throughout the different stages. So you'll see here that, that I have um, nurturing on here. A, a use case that I have is if a lead comes in and it, it's assigned to the marketing team, well let's say that threshold is met, that score or that grade, and it gets passed to the sales team. The sales could get on the phone with them and say, actually this person is not qualified, I wanna nurture them. So they could basically give it a nurturing state, which could trigger things in, in the back end of the marketing automation to either send them new content, um, change their score, add them to a different campaign. 
So as you think about these different stages, you can just think about you know, what's the process from a new lead, from being owned by uh, marketing and passing it to sales, and then what are all the in-between stages? Jen, what are some of the criteria of a nurturing account? I mean, is it someone that's not ready to purchase, or is it someone that decides? I mean, use some examples. That sure, so um, it could be that someone um, is, is just not ready yet. So maybe they don't have the budget. So, you know, they come to you and they say, I, I love your product, um, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, my budget for next year and I want to do X, Y, and Z, but they're not ready to pull the trigger. Well, a sales rep doesn't necessarily need to keep calling up on that person, you know, because they know this person is, is a year out from purchasing, but the objective would be give, get them to a nurturing campaign so that your brand stays top of mind. And so that may be just a piece of collateral every three months. But, you know, it means that they're constantly being reminded of your brand. Any other questions? Um, okay, the last two are basically how you want to think about your data. Um, the first one is list segmentations. So the reason that this is important is because, as I mentioned, all of your data is going to sync back and forth between the two systems, but the data points might not be there to begin with. So that would mean that you either need to create them in the CRM and marketing automation or both. Um, so as an example, um, one segmentation that I use frequently is competitors. So that would mean that you have a list of domains um, and then you could say something like, if anyone has an email address with this domain, then I want to, I want to exclude them from my marketing materials because you don't want to be marketing to your competitors. So that's a standard one that, again, you can just do by email address. Um, another one may be prospects. So that would be a non-paying client, anyone that's a lead versus a client. Well, if everyone is in your database the exact same way, you're going to need some type of differentiator to say, you know, this is a lead, this is a paid client, this is a former client, um, so that, again, you can target people um, very directly. And then lastly, um, clients by product or service. So if you sell multiple things, and let's say you want to do an upsell, well, you're going to need to know exactly what it is that customer is buying from you to begin with in order to upsell or cross-sell. So you may want to think about different ways in the CRM to track what it is they've bought from you or they're planning to buy from you. Um, and then the last one is different lead nurturing campaigns. So Catherine, this may help with the question you asked, but basically, and again, this is big picture. So what do I want to build out over time? What are things that I want running in the background? Um, I, I used the example earlier of users in a free trial. And um, that's just because I work with a bunch of technology clients that are typically giving something out for free in hopes to convert that person. So again, while someone is in a trial or if they're using something for free, then you want to continue to nurture to them with the hopes of actually converting them. Um, another one would be a lead score. So again, the number is whatever you want it to be, but if they are at a low score and you're trying to push them beyond that threshold, then you want to add them to a campaign, send them different messages, incentivize them to click and to engage. And again, once they interact with you, that'll be scored and push them over that threshold. Once they get pushed over that threshold, they will be removed out of the campaign automatically. And then inactive prospects. So I mentioned earlier that you can um, decrease the score based on inactivity. You can also do different campaigns to re-engage people. So you can say, you know, show me everyone in my database that hasn't engaged with us in the last six months and start to market to them and, and see if you can, um, you know, get them re-engaged and ideally convert them into a paying customer. And that is it. <laughs> Perfect timing. Yes? Do you think it is worth investing in a marketing automation system if we cannot or do not uh, integrate with our, our CRM system? There are, um, 
you can use a marketing automation platform as a standalone, but the, the problem is you don't have complete visibility. So really it just becomes your glorified marketing system that doesn't necessarily pass everything over to sales unless you give your sales reps access to the marketing automation platform. Um, but that can be tricky for sales reps. So I, I recommend that you do integrate with a CRM, but if you're just at a place in your company where you can't do it now, then you know maybe you start with the marketing automation and then integrate the CRM. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Yeah. Next, Peggy, if you and Todd would like to come on up. Uh, we have Peggy Brookhouse, and she's in the back. Let's give her a few minutes. 